Sounds good. Welcome, everybody. This is the Impact uh, Factor Event Blab. I'm Scott. He's Ken. Ken's the founder of JV Alert and the Impact Factor, author of the Impact Factor and the founder of Impact Events. So welcome, Ken. Glad to have you on the Blab with us. Fantastic to be here, Scott. It's always a pleasure to be with you. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure being with you, too. So the event is in Denver. It's uh, the beginning of end of April, beginning of May. So uh, I think it's April 29th or 30th, 1st and 2nd, right? It's April 29th through May the 1st. May the 1st. Awesome. So awesome days. Yeah, you've got some pretty amazing uh, speakers lined up. I know Joel Calm is going to be there. I'm excited to, I'm the MC, so I'm excited about that. And I'm excited to introduce him and everybody else. But uh, who are some of the people that are going to be uh, sharing the stage there and sharing their knowledge? Well, uh, just a so I always forget people and then I feel really, really bad. <laughs> well, we don't want to get all of them. Next week, we're going to tell you about a few more, but... Uh, it's, it seems to me that last week you said that you were just uh, you were going to announce this week some new uh, faces. So I'm just curious as to who I'm going to be seeing. Yeah. Um, uh, Tamara M McCleary was one of the people that we announced this uh, week. Uh, she's an amazing woman. She's been all over the country. Seems like she's always flying uh, somewhere to talk to some corporate uh Group, but she is just incredible in terms of uh, being a, a real thought leader and, and building relationships and conscious business, and has worked a lot with women's issues. So I'm I'm really excited to have her there. <clears throat> um, and uh, Felicia Slattery is going to be there. We're going to have her on on the show here uh, coming up uh, pretty soon, I think. And uh, so that's always a great addition, and just you know, a, a, an incredible group of, uh, of real thought leaders. Uh, I just announced that uh, the, the founder of CEO Space, uh, Bernie Dorman, is going to be there. Oh, good. So lots, lots of incredible people, and, and there's still some I haven't announced yet. So I'm, I'm excited uh, that we've got a, a, a great group of people. And you can get a list of uh, all the ones that have been announced, at least, if you go to theimpactevent.com. Okay, great. Cool. And so what's new with the movies and the documentaries and the short films that you're creating? You well, know, it's a, you know, most people spend like five years to make one blockbuster at, at a time. And yeah. you are coming out with three. Well, I, I, um, I like the busy part, I guess. <laughs> uh, this is a busy day. Actually, I'm going to do this wonderful Blab uh, podcast with you. And then I'm meeting right after this with my Impact Platinum Mastermind. And then tonight I'm going to meet with the Impact uh, uh, Marketing Association group. And tomorrow we meet with the filmmakers. So uh, I've got over, I think, 1,600 filmmakers that are involved. And uh, a bunch of them will pack into a, a room and uh, we'll have a great time together. And I know I'll get quizzed like crazy on What's the progress on the movie and all that kind of stuff? Uh, well, part of the progress is that uh, we're doing some great search for uh, the trailer stuff. So we're working really hard on trailer stuff. We're casting people for the trailer. And we're finding a, a really special uh, uh, special effects person. Uh, and we've got some great people that have applied for that uh, position on, on special effects. Um, that have had some major movie uh, track records. Awesome. So we'll see exactly how that all settles out, but I'm excited about that. Um, and, you know, it's a process. It takes a while. You said it takes years to develop a movie. And, yeah. and that's, we've been in this actually a year and a half uh, since the beginning of this. And it'll take a little while longer. So uh, stay tuned for all kinds of exciting stuff that's coming up. But, um, but we're really excited about the the new trailer and the actors that are involved in it. And uh, some of the film people are just doing amazing work. So I'm excited. Are you going to have a world premiere at the Impact event? Like, are we going to be able to see the trailer or part of the trailer? You never know. <laughs> you might get to see something or you might not. We'll, we, we will see how things go. 
It, um, you know, it, it's going to be an exciting time, though, at the Impact event because we, we will be filling people in on exactly uh, how they can get involved with all the different parts of that. And uh, there's lots of opportunities and lots of things that are coming up uh, in, the, in, in the coming months. So we're going to share that together here on this uh, podcast and our live labs and and we're going to share it at the impact event too so hmm. great. you know talking about trailers it reminded me of a michael jackson story and he yeah. was sponsored by pepsi right and when pepsi got him they were so excited obviously right i mean they wanted to share it with all their sales people and what they were doing and everything else and and so the director of sales or the president or I forget how, like somebody way up there is talking to Michael and he's saying because they're in the process of making a commercial a Pepsi commercial right and he says and, on fire right <laughs> yeah this, this is before yeah he, he ended up being on fire on the Pepsi commercial but this was before that happened and he uh, and he's talking to Michael and he says you know like in two weeks we've got our national sales meeting and we'd love to show this commercial and Michael goes, no, can't show it. And he could, and there was this. This is a great example of communication, right? Because he couldn't figure out why Michael wouldn't let him show the commercial. Now it wasn't complete. I know it's not complete, but it's almost complete. The guys are going to go nuts. Let's show him. No. And of course, Michael Jackson was such a perfectionist. He didn't want it to go out until it was, it was all complete, right? And it was the way it was supposed to be. And of course, he didn't, Michael Jackson didn't understand that it didn't have to be perfect for the sales guys. All they needed was to see Michael with a, a Pepsi can in his hand and they would go crazy, right? So this kind of went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And the guys, the president or whoever is getting really frustrated because he just can't figure out why Michael won't say yes, right? And then he's got this, oh, it's not done. It's not perfect. So then he came at Michael and he said, look, we know it's not done. They all know it's not done. We just want to do a little teaser to show them what's coming. Doesn't And nobody else will ever see it. Just these guys and they're just going to be on fire. And then Michael said, oh, okay, if that's all you want. Because in his mind, it was you're going to show this and it's going to be seen by 5 billion people, right? Yeah. You know, because everybody sees everything oh, he does. Yeah. Not that it's going to be this little room with 200 people in it and they're just going to be so excited uh, to, just to see him on screen, right? <laughs> it's funny how, you know, we want everything to be just right, and sometimes it doesn't need to be just right. That's that's true. I mean, I think uh, it, it's an interesting art uh, that we that we go through. And and one of the things I did uh, this week was we've been getting a lot of uh, feedback. We're doing an original score for the Impact Manifesto short film. And we've been getting a lot of feedback about the music. And we put together a couple of different musical styles uh, for just the intro part of it. And we sent it out to a research panel because I'd gotten back some people. Uh, I, I sent it out first to, to a small group of people, maybe, maybe five or six people that were musicians. And I trusted their opinion. And and um, and said, what do you think? What do you think of this uh, this original score? And I got back various opinions, you know, about that. Uh, whenever we're asked to critique something, that's what we do, right? So yes. we pick it all apart. And people should be aware of that when they go out asking for other people's opinions. That what they're what they're doing, what they immediately think is um, how can I find fault with this? You know, not that they, they are really thinking negatively, but, but they, they think that that's what their job is. And what the job of a critic really should be is, uh, at least somebody who's reviewing this, you know, to, to help make it better, is to make it better. So if you have something that you could uh, add that would uh, make it better, then, then definitely you want to hear those kinds of things, right? So I sent out uh, that those uh, two uh, tracks to different people, and I got varying opinions, people that loved it and people that hated it. The other problem with it, too, is it's out of context, right? It's yeah. not, it, you're not seeing the scenes moving back and forth, and you're not seeing the people speaking, and, and so that also makes it really difficult. We did, yeah, we did actually send them uh, the copy of the video, the introduction part oh, of it. okay. 
for. So they did get to see the the complete picture, but it's not the complete. Uh, it's not the the whole short film. So it's just one section of it, which is right. true. But at any rate, it's it's kind of interesting. So so then I sent it out to a, a, a group of anonymous uh, people that I have on my research panel. So I actually. Uh, I think I, maybe I've talked to you about this before, but I started one of the very first research uh, companies on the internet. Mm. And we had a panel of thousands and thousands or tens or 20,000 people or something like that that will take surveys and stuff like that. So then we sent the three, uh, the two different tests to people on that list. And it was really interesting because we asked them which one they preferred and they came back almost 50-50, one uh, uh, or the other. So, what do you what do you do in a case like that? So, what do you do when the opinions are, uh, I like this one better, or I like this one better? They're really strongly held opinions, but they're entirely the opposite, right? So, so and and they're evenly divided. And I think I think that's a good uh, a thing to point out to people when they're looking at critics because the the composer came back to me and said well what do we do now you know because it's 50 50 down the split i don't know what direction do i go and the truth is what you do is you choose your audience because some people are always going to relate to one style of music and some people are always going to relate to another style of mm. music uh and the same thing is true of any message or any product that we put together uh, and we have to be aware that what we're doing is we're developing an audience for whatever we want to put out. Right. <clears throat> At some point, you have to make a decision. I, I think it's really good. I think it's good that we got anonymous feedback. If it had come back 90% one way and 10% the other way, you'd, you'd get a clear direction of exactly right. what that is. But when it's right up and down the middle, what that does you is it actually gives you the freedom to take the, the, the position that you would like to take. That's what I was going to say. If it's 50, 50, then I'm going to pick the one I like, because, yeah. like you said, you're creating your audience for you and they need to like you. And if they like you, part of it yeah. is they like your music, right? <laughs> we're all, we're all built up of all these different things. And the reason why people like us or don't like us, you know, often come down to, these small, subtle differences that we don't even think about, right. you know, and uh, and so I think that uh, you find those common threads of the people that really, really uh, are are uh, connected to us because of the way that we are, and and that's part of you know being authentic, you know, trying to uh, live in an authentic place and be yourself. Because I tell you that there's thousands of people that, that see things one way and thousands of people that see another way, and you don't need them all, right? Yeah. So you don't necessarily need a tribe of 50 million people. You can get a tribe of 5,000 people or 10,000 people that really, really like you. That's enough to earn a, a solid living for sure. It is. And you remind me of when I was first getting pre prepped to go up on stage and speak in front of groups of people which is like 10 years ago, and they brought in a voice coach, a speaking coach. And I was terrified because I thought he was going to tell me to just don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And just like all the things that I felt comfortable doing up on stage, because I'd already been up there once or twice, uh, he would just tell me like, you can't do that. And the first thing he said to me was, we want you to be more you, not yeah. less you, right? And I was just like, oh, okay, I can be more me if you help me be more me. I don't know what that is, but I like that a lot better than being less me. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So I, I warned you before we started uh, <clears throat> before we started this lab that uh, I really wanted to pick your brain and, and see what's working for you these days. And I know you've got a lot of exciting things going on. So let's talk uh, a little bit about you and your, your world right now. All righty. Um, the biggest thing that happened to me was about a, a year ago last October. And uh, the company that does the uh, Starbucks app invited, they're in Vancouver, and they invited me down to talk to their marketing department about podcasting. They wanted to podcast. So I said, okay. And I spent two hours with them. And at the end, the marketing director, who is generally a very excitable person anyway, 
was bouncing off the walls. And he just said, Scott, the stuff you shared with us was amazing. It was terrific. It was this, it's that. My head was like this big. And, and he says, you have to make a video course on how to podcast. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, like I was just swept along by this tsunami of just energy. And a couple of weeks later, I'm in Colombia and Ecuador and on my way to Machu Picchu. So as I'm going through my travels, I'm thinking about this course and I planned it all out on the beach in Ecuador. And then I thought, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years. I, I don't need prompting. If, if I want to tell you something about podcasting, I can just take a topic and I can talk for two or three or four or five minutes without even thinking about it. And I thought, I know in my course, I'm going to have section A, B, C, D, E. And I think most videos are boring, right? Because it's some boring background like this. It never changes. And you just hit this guy and go, blah, 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 blah. And I thought, what could I do to make this course like different, right? Well, if I have Machu Picchu in the background and I'm telling you in this section, you're going to be learning about how to set up your podcast and how to do this and how to do that. Wouldn't that be exciting? So that's what I did is I had this little selfie stick, which I don't have with me and my iPod and a little wired mic. And I'm got Machu Picchu in the background. And I'm saying this in this section, you're going to be in. And, and I've missed a section. Right. And I didn't realize till I was home. Oh, I forgot this section. But I had done a, a, a video. The roads that I was on were one and a quarter car wide. And yeah. there was a cliff on one side. And you were at the bottom of a cliff on the other side. Okay. And we would drive for 10 miles around these windy roads in the Andes. And I just, at one point, took my camera, stuck it out the window, and held it for 10 minutes. Because I just like... I cannot believe this road, right? <laughs> so for that one section, what I did is I took the sound down on the road and it was just and I just talked over. So it was like you're driving along with Scott in the Andes, and I'm telling you about this. We're gonna talk about how to make a podcast episode or how to get the best mic or whatever the topic of the section was. And I and then of course I got home, I did all the screen shares, put it up, and a year later I have um 10,000 students taking podcasting courses from me. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And when when I first looked at it, I, I you know, I've, in the beginning, it was just, I want to do the course because Earl told me, do the course. And it was really funny when somebody just tells you to do something and I just, i like, why did you do it? Earl told me that I would never have done it. If Earl hadn't told me, he said, do it. So I did it. Like, it's really weird, right? And, of course, it was congruent with me, too. There was no resistance. It was There was a big part of me that wanted to do it. Just never thought about it that much. And when I got back and I did the course and I had looked at Udemy was the platform I decided I would put my course up on, it just seemed, right? I really wasn't, I had no idea. And if nobody ever took the course, it didn't matter. I just had fun making it, right? And, uh, but I liked it. And I thought, wow, Udemy is easy. It's simple. And it has tons of students. And then I got tons of students. And then what I did is I told uh, four or five of my clients, you know, stock options and alternative health and EFT and uh, it just weird, you know, all like there was no thinking about it. Right. These are just all my clients. And I just told them. And to my shock, they all said, yeah, let's do a course together. So I ended up doing courses with these people, which is why now I have 36 courses on you damn me on all in a year like that's three courses a month <laughs> how did you, you know and of course i couldn't do it myself like in the beginning i did all the video editing i did all that stuff right so all of a sudden i have three people that i'm recording with and i'm going oh well if they wait for me to do the video editing if they wait for me to do this if they wait for me it'll be like 10 years before it gets done because i'm not you know I don't really want to be that productive at this stage of my life, right? <laughs> I'll put it to you that way. So I found a really good video editor in the Philippines. And she, like, and it's weird, right? Because, like, this is my baby. I don't want to let go. So I'm giving it to her shaking. She has a way better job than me, 
like like way better job than me right like i'm like oh this is really good right uh so that also what happens then is is that i went from creating the like i still do create i still create the courses uh, for myself but i go from co-producing and in into and directing the course production and then we, we create the course she does the editing she uploads it then we review it I do a little bit of fiddling around and it's up and it's at the point now where I can pretty much do it in my sleep so yeah. what's exciting for me is in uh, two weeks I'm going to be going to Toronto I'm in Vancouver Canada I'm going to be going to Toronto Ontario Canada I'm going to be teaching a group of about 20 to 25 uh, experts uh, how to take their expertise and turn it into a course, put it on Udemy, okay? And these are people that are already learning, like they're writing books or they're like, so it's not what do I talk about or any of that sort of stuff. They're a little bit more advanced than that. They've been with this particular uh, facilitator for a while now and it's, yeah, we're doing books and we're doing all this sort of stuff. And they said, wow, well, video course is great. And... Uh, and so this has caused another change in my whole process because now it's like, well, you know, it's okay with three or four, you know, or five people that are sort of spread out over the months. But what happens when you have 25 people that want to go right now, right? And Devin Mike, Davin Michaels is, is actually one of the people that's going to be helping me. I talked to him when we were down in Orlando a few months ago and, um, so we put together kind of this system like and I'm I've never been a big systems person, but I have to be a big system yeah. person because I have like this avalanche coming down this mountain at me. And if I don't figure out something really fast, I'm just going to get totally snowed under, which is a really nice place to be. Exactly. And that's exactly what I tell people about systems and automatization. You know, when I get to. Uh, that in my impact action plan when I'm telling people about building systems is the point that you put systems in is the point that everything is working and everything's doing really, really well because it doesn't make any sense to systematize things that aren't working. Okay? Yes. That'll only put the business faster. And so many people think they have to build the systems in advance before they can create anything. And really what we want to do is we want to create those systems. When you get that avalanche of work that's coming in that you – you just uh, can't get out from under. That's when systems are are wonderful. Yes, yeah. So that's so that's so it's it, it's interesting how I have set myself my life up because for years I wanted to have this. I didn't want to be stuck in one place. Go somewhere if I wanted to go somewhere, right? And and be there for like a month or something. And I have a client in Belize. And so I'm going to be going down to Belize. She she's doing working on a social enterprise where she's helping the local farmers. Uh, turmeric is a really good root and spice. Uh, Indians cook with it all the time. It's really supposed to be healthy. Blah blah blah. All this stuff. It is a weed in Belize. Yeah. It, it's like it's growing all over the place. Farmers ignore it. So she's found a few farmers and she said, look. You know, if you can harvest it, I will sell it in Canada and you'll get a fair price. And, of course, the farmer says, I'm lazy. I don't want to do that. You know, are you kidding me? And she says, I know you don't. So what I want to do is I want to take youth on the street in Belize and I yeah. want to hire them and have them harvest it. But you, it's your farm and you've got to manage them. And you got to make sure that it all works right. Because I'm not a farmer. They're not a farmer. And so you got to, like, get them working right. And so she's got these, the farm group, the Belizean youth, whoever finds those people. And then she's come up to Canada. She's talked to a couple of the uh, grocery chains there. They just think it's wonderful. And she's creating a paste. So she's creating this nice little business down there. And I'm going to go and record it and video it and do her website and all sorts of stuff while I'm there. Wonderful. We're going to talk about to do uh, Impact Magazine because uh, oh. that's a great piece of impact, you know. So I'll do that. To, uh, connected with uh, Ken Lovett. From I'll, the impact. I'll talk to Ken about that for sure, yeah. So I'm really excited because I, now I get to go to Toronto and teach. I get to go to Belize and teach. And then I talked to her and I said, you know, 
I've got all this video work coming up. Why can't I teach some young people in Belize how to edit the video? Because, yeah. you know, if they can do it in the Philippines, why can't they do it in Belize, right? And uh, and she was like, oh, yeah. So she put me in touch with the uh, Belizean Youth Education Committee Department in the, in the government. And so I'll probably meet them, and then I might do a one- or two-day course with them just showing them. Because it's not like you – it's not, not creating a movie, right? There's no special effects. It's just somebody sitting there talking, talking, talking. And you might have a slide come in or a picture come in or a little text come in. So it's all really, really basic. And then they chop it into, you know, three to five minute segments and then they upload it. And Belize has really good infrastructure and everything else. So I'm really hoping that I'll be able to take this opportunity that they'll run with the opportunity and then they'll be able to work. I've already talked to, to Davin and he's, you know, he says, well, we don't really have video editors. We can, I guess, train them. So part of me is kind of going, well, if he's flexible, then maybe he could manage this group because I don't. That I don't want to have anything to do with that. I just like teaching them, right? And since I'm in Belize and I haven't really spent any time in Honduras or Guatemala or Costa Rica or Panama, I thought, you know, it'd be kind of nice to spend a, a week here and a week there and a week here and a week there. So this is turning into it. And of course, if I'm doing videos and I can have the beach as the background or a volcano as the background. Mr. World, Mr. Inter Oh, here. I love that. World Traveler. That's right. That was what will be next. Yep. And so when I come back up, I'm going to be doing another uh, training on how to do online courses in Toronto. <laughs> Just be two months later, right? So these students will come back and they'll say, okay, this is what we're doing. You know, do we need some help with marketing, all that sort of stuff. And then we'll have another group that will train at the same time. So it's, it's kind of interesting how it's just a matter of, having a vision and then planning the vision and making it work. Absolutely. Sounds like you're doing a great job of that. And uh, I'm really excited for you. That's great. You. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. And, yeah. Yeah. What's the, what's the attraction for Ecuador? It seems like I have some friends that have, uh, keep going down to Ecuador too. It must be a, an amazing place. It, it's a beautiful country. The people are great. It's Spanish speaking, uh, but, there are some people around, you know, there is a bit of English here and there. Uh, the scenery is great. I, I went and I spent a, a day in Quito, which was, which was nice. I would like to spend more time there, but I really spent a week on a beach in a village with 200 people. Yeah. <laughs> and I was, that was, it was just great. Uh, you know, it was just a lot of fun. I just had a, a good friend of mine that moved down there into a little town. I don't know if it has 200 people <laughs> in the town, but uh, it's interesting coming from the suburbs of Philadelphia uh, and, go, and picking that spot to live. But uh, yeah. it uses the U.S. dollar as part. It's got an Ecuadorian currency in the U.S. dollar, and it's interchangeable. Um, <laughs> so it's easy that way. It's inexpensive, and the climate is perfect. It's funny because it's on the equator, but it's a lot of it is high, and um, uh, you know, so it's like spring all the time. Sounds sounds wonderful. Yeah, it is. It is. When does your trip start? Next Tuesday. And then, and you're going to Denver for sure. So. Yeah, I'll get back. I'll be home about a month, and then I'm going to come to Denver, and uh, and we'll see. Uh, <laughs> I'm. So are, are we going to be broadcasting from uh, from uh, down south next week? That's right. That's right. No, I won't. I won't be leaving till Tuesday. So. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, we're Monday. All right. So we'll just catch you when you're hectic. That's right. Yeah. Next week is no problem. The following week, uh, it'll be in Belize for right. two weeks, and uh, and then it'll be depending on internet connections. But I don't think that'll be a problem. Then it'll be in Honduras, and then it'll be in Costa Rica, and then it'll be in Panama, and I don't know. I've been. I really liked Colombia. And so I might go to Medellin in Colombia. Uh, oh. Yeah, it's kind of, I don't know. And then I, yeah, I might get there and want to go to Brazil, but I don't think I, I can be alone, gone that long. <laughs> well, it sounds like quite an adventure. This is now the International Impact Show. That's right, the International Impact Show. 
And, you know, one of the things that was really interesting about six months ago, I was talking to uh, a gal I dated 10 years ago, and I was telling her about my trip to uh, South America. And she says, way to go. You did what you said you were going to do. And I was like, what? And she says, 10 years ago, you were talking about living this lifestyle that you're now living. And the, one of the reasons why I couldn't do it 10 years ago was I had two teenage boys living with me. And at that point, I felt they really needed stability because they hadn't had a lot of stability. So I made a commitment. I wasn't going to be leaving this location where I'm living until they were finished school and, uh, and kept it. And now it's one of them still living with me, but he's working and he's an apprentice and it works out great because he can look after the house while I'm gone for two months. And, uh, but it was just, it's just funny how, you know, we have dreams that we want to live and we can't always live them today. It has nothing to do with like you could, if you wanted to, but it would totally disrupt and cause havoc in other people's lives, like my, my son's lives, right? I mean, they needed their dad when they were teenagers. It would be really crazy to go spend six months in South America and abandon them. But now they're adults. They're pretty much independent. And I'm able to, to actually live that dream. So I think it's kind of interesting how we have seasons of our lives. And sometimes I think people get really frustrated because it's like, oh, I really want to do this. And it's like, dude, if you could do this, you couldn't do this because of this, 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 and that that's going on in your life. And you either have to clean it up or you have to wait for the season to change. Like if you have a baby and you want to go live in Papua New Guinea, like don't. So it's very simple, right? <laughs> you know, that is not the time to go live in Papua New Guinea with the pygmies or whoever, right? That's not the time. And, and I think sometimes people don't step back and look at their whole life and say, you know, this is where I am right now. And it's because of these things, and whatever they may be. It could be you have a, a mother who's very uh, ill, an, old, you know, an elderly mother or a grandparent who's really ill and needs you. Or it could be you have kids and they really need you. Or it could be all sorts of different reasons, right? And it, But it's not permanent. It's, there, nothing is ever permanent. So it's kind of like, what do I need to do to get there? And what am I in? What situation am I in? Well, I'm not in a situation if I have young kids where I can, and there are people that do this, right? I'm not saying that you can't do it. I'm just saying that for the majority or let's say the median, the vast majority of people, it's not a good idea to take your kids with you and trek across China or something like that, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's just but, not. Uh, Opportunities are limitless, but but definitely we have to make choices within that framework. We can't we can't do everything right now. So it's good for us to to live in the moment and to choose the things that uh, are really working for us right now. That's right. And then that future vision, because you're living proof that uh, you know even if it takes ten years, uh, it, it's not too late necessarily. So that's right. That's, uh, that's right. And I'm at that point where. I don't want to wait 10 more years to do this because who knows, you know, I don't want to be in a wheelchair wheeling around and I hope, think, you know, hopefully that won't happen. But, you know, there also becomes a time where you think, well, time is running out in terms of doing some of these things. So you have to look because we don't know, you know, no one's going to be around 200 years from now. So sometimes you have to sort of say, I, I totally agree with you. It's like you can't. I'm going to, I've got all excited now. My mind's got like four things it wants to say at the same time, but. Uh, yeah, you, you, you really, uh, I mean, we have to maximize our time and resources because we all have limited time and resources, uh, but there's no limits on what the possibilities are for the future. If you, uh, if you live in the moment and you, uh, and you try and leverage the, what things you can, you know, you can't control everything, but you can start seeds every single day and, and right. have a huge impact. And that's probably a, a good point for us to kind of wrap up for today but um, it is but the impact event you don't have to go to belize or any anywhere close to that distance to get there it's in denver and it's on april 29th through the uh may the first um bernie dorman's going to be there tamara mccleary's going to be there sam crowley kathleen gage uh, daryl eaves uh, felicia slattery jeremiah 
Uh, Demarius is going to be there, Davin Michaels, Stephen Memo. Uh, and I'll just put a little bird in your ear because I, uh, uh, I haven't announced it yet, but this will be the first one. Kelly Flutinger is going to be there. Oh, good. For uh, the Impact event. So I'm really excited about that, a fellow uh, part-time Canadian anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, so that's going to be lots and lots of fun, and um, can't wait to see everybody there. Right now is a good time to do that because the early bird special is going on now. It'll save you four hundred dollars on a ticket to go to the Impact event and get that locked up while that uh, early bird special is still there. So great. So Ken, what's the URL if someone wanted to go? It's theimpactevent.com. Awesome. Theimpactevent.com. Definitely go there. Take a look at all the people that are coming already, and um, there'll be more. Cool. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. We really appreciate you. We know that uh, you make an impact in the lives of the people around you, and we hope we can see you at the Impact event. And if uh, if you're around every uh, 1030 on the West Coast, and I guess it's 1230 on the East Coast, uh, we're going to be here chatting about uh, making an impact in people's lives. Be happy to have you join us, and we'll talk to you next time. Thanks. Great day.